corruption. How good governance becomes the last stage of democratic revolutions. Alina Munju Pipidi, Hattie School of Governance, Berlin. When the wall came down, I was a PhD student in psychiatry waiting for the 14th Congress of the Romanian Communist Party under the leadership of Comrade Ceausescu. Thank you. It is a great honor to, to be here. Let me show you a picture immediately. You may ask yourself what kind of specific architecture this is. This is an attempt to build a castle. If you ask yourself what the flag stands for, for what family, if you are a Game of Thrones watcher or whatever, well, the flag actually stands for a monopolistic oil distribution company which belongs to the gentleman who is building the castle. And if you ask yourself why somebody would build the castle in the yard of a gas station, who is the person crazy enough to do this, you have to understand that it is quite important for him to send the signal that he controls all the oil in his territory. And this goes also with the architecture and everything that you see here. And if you ask yourself what this picture is coming from, I took it myself 10 years ago in a UN mission that I did in Crimea. This was the villa under construction of the leader of the Communist Party in Simferopol, Crimea. So we have to understand that countries don't need to be invaded in order to rot and to fall at the slightest wind movement. This country was definitely there. Now, you know, I am into changing behavior. I started, as I said, as a, I was preparing to become a PhD in psychiatry, then the wall fell down and I no longer lived in Romania, so I'm a political scientist now, but I'm still unfortunately in the business of changing behavior. Or what economists say, but not of one, one person, not of small groups, but of societies as a whole. And this is something that economists call institutional change or institutional transformation. So I'm not dealing with corruption as an individual deviation. I'm not interested in, or very little interested in countries where corruption is an individual deviation, which are extremely few. So presently we have in the world a majority of countries where actually corruption, in other words, a particular allocation of public resources, which gives to some people far more than their due, is the rule of the game. This is what goes on. And the fair distribution is the exception. So our whole effort of those who look into this and of the international community who moved quite a lot in the last 10 years in this field is how actually to build merit-based societies. Because you may believe, you know, uh, hearing, I was very impressed by the discussion between the heads of the academia earlier, but let me just start with my second slide, which is the correlation between corruption and innovation, which is extremely close. So in other words, if I know your corruption, I can very well predict how many inventions this country had last year. And I can roughly predict that quite a big number of countries have no innovation at all. And the reason why they don't put any money in research and technology is not ideological. It's simply because it's far more difficult to steal money that you put into research and technology than building highway, airports, soccer clubs, and whatever else, you know, gets uh, one elected or you give the contract directly to your brother. So in other words, you see how corruption actually subverts development directly. Right? And it gets even worse. You can see, for instance, how brain drain and corruption are closely associated. I'm presenting these Bavarian associations, but trust me, because you can see the countries. But trust me, we do have more refined models to the extent that statistics can be called refined in an environment of very sophisticated scientists such as you. This is what we, you do. So we see that the best governed countries in the world, countries like Denmark, for instance, in the right hand side, here are also having very little brain drain while corrupt countries such as my country, Romania, or such as Greece, actually most people who are talented, most people who are bright are fleeing from these countries because they want to go in, a, in another economy where they are appreciated. And this, of course, it's a vicious circle. This is the vicious circle because it means that people who dislike the rules of the game and who could change it, it's very difficult to beat a critical mass out of them because it's them who are constantly fleeing. Let me show you a little bit more how corruption 
Uh, we are we've been discussing about the fall of the Berlin Wall like a great celebration. Well, you know, it is. Even for me, it is. My country has traveled quite a lot. It's not there yet what I would like to see, it, but it has traveled quite a lot. East Germany, Poland, you know, there are a number of countries which are successes. You can see them here in the right-hand side. These are the successful countries. And the little spot on the green, on top right, it's the European Union average. But what about these countries in red here? This is what is left of Eastern Europe. These countries in red here, Central Asia, Russia, Ukraine, right, Azerbaijan, these are countries which are not doing so well. What you see in this graph is the very close correlation between control of corruption and freedom of the press. But if you look at what this really captive states, states like the one that I showed in Crimea when we started, are experiencing, you should look at the fact that life expectancy collapsed in some of the states. This is how bad actually it is. And there is absolutely no hope in sight. These countries are not progressing. Governance is a very difficult thing to change. The way I work is that I try to look at the very few countries which change to learn some lessons, and I have seven contemporary success cases of which three are contested. And when I mean seven contemporary success cases, I mean in the last 30 years, because prior to this we have absolutely no measurement of corruption, so it's difficult to judge. So in order to multiply my cases, you know the difficulty of working with very few cases, I have to work with historical case studies, which countries which did it, which managed to change from rules of the game where corruption was the norm to when corruption was an exception 100 years ago or 150 years ago or 200 years ago. And only then I managed to reach a little bit of a, of a decent number of countries. There's more evidence here a little bit. Look at this. It's just tax collection. I mean, you might have heard actually that we now have a new European Commission, a new president of the European Commission, and apparently they're going to investigate the period when he was Prime Minister of Luxembourg. Because when we were recommending austerity to all these countries, they were actually money laundering there in massive quantities. And what you see here is that we would be able actually to raise double the yearly EU budget if all EU member states would just control corruption at the Danish level. Danish being like, you know, the best that, that we do in Europe, which is really very good. And the last, last proof that this is really having a big, big impact is we are discussing this crisis of confidence of the European Union. Now I'm sensitive to that because most of my research is funded by European Union. I don't take money directly from governments from rather obvious reasons, right? <laughs> okay. But I will study corruption of the European institutions next just in order to prove my point that you can do that. So, in fact, control of corruption at national level or how people believe that their governments are able to control corruption at national level is now number two source of distrust in Europe after growth. So it's a very important source of distrust. If you look at the left hand hands here, you would see Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy, Cyprus. Look a little bit at what happened with these corruption indicators of these countries. People simply lost entirely the faith of their government, in their governments, that their governments are governing for the best interest. And they have been governing for the best interest all these years. Okay, you might ask yourself if there is some special gene which makes somebody corrupt. Having some sort of, you know, background medical studies, I would be happy to report that I found it, but no question of that. There is a little bit, so at the individual level, we do have some evidence that people who are very high on skills uh, are less tolerant towards corruption. But actually, the individual choice, and that's what you see here, this is the World Value Survey, you see how it goes down with uh, the tolerance for corruption. The more educated people are, the less they tolerate it. But it's not just education, but it's any sort of skill. People who believe they can manage a situation and they can win, either by cheating, they tend to be less tolerant towards corruption. However, the role of the individual in determining if he's going to bribe, for instance, or if he's not going to bribe, is not so important. Because people tend to do, and this is what economists call an institution, people tend to play by the rule of the game. If you are in a country where actually bribes are given to get the Olympics contract, well, you may be Siemens, you will bribe. Because otherwise you won't get the contract, right? So this is very much how it works. So it's not so much a matter of individual choice. And this makes it what we call a collective action problem because it's not one individual that you might target. You have to find the tipping point to change this balance, to 
put the balance in the other direction. And this is what we're, our work is. We work very much with, with statistical models, but trying to get better, more refined indicators and perception indicators in order to be able to actually trace change in governance, trace change over time, and find indicators which are sensitive to policy intervention. You've seen earlier the CPI from Transparency International. Well, I don't know. How many of you really believe that Italy is doing worse than Ghana? Don't have to raise your hands. Italy is not doing worse than Ghana, right? Neither is Rwanda doing better than Romania and Bulgaria. This simply shows you how blunt indicators we have. We have to move to indicators which mean something in very concrete terms so that policymakers, civil society, whoever works on this know how to handle this. And this is more or less our model. We argue that control of corruption as a society is an equilibrium between existing resources to spoil, and I can prove my point that whoever puts more money into procurement in European Union actually is more corrupt Right? So there is good government spending and there's bad government spending. Research and development is good government spending. You know, doing all kinds of fancy projects is bad government spending leads directly to corruption. We have proof. And natural resources and many other things like this on the side of resources. But on the other hand, you have constraints and the capacity of constraints. And historically, you ask yourself, why didn't democratization solve all this? Why are not people more demanding? I mean, we see people in the streets, in Brazil, in India, in Bulgaria, they haven't been indoors for the past two years. Every three months, they are out uh, following one government, asking for a better government, right? But it's very difficult, even if you manage, you know, the new government which come with also spoil. So this is rather the difficulty of building this kind of equilibrium in this society. And the reason is that indeed constraints increase historically as countries democratize, but resources also increase. We have a state which is bigger and bigger compared to how it was historically, which simply means we put more and more resources into one basket, and therefore you have to have the capacity of supervising whatever happens in that basket. But we are optimists. Don't take from what I said and the fact that we really don't have success cases. This is before we started to, to research it. What you see here is a projection of how countries are doing according to their human development index, since this is quite a strong association between the two. So countries which are above the line are doing are positive outliers. They are doing better than the human development index would predict. Countries which are underneath are doing worse, and quite a lot of, of Eastern Europe, the eastern part of Eastern Europe is underneath, right? Plus Ecuador and a number of other countries there. But on top, you see quite, except the historical achievers which are here, you see quite some countries, right? You see Chile, you see Uruguay, you see a bunch of Caribbean islands, you see a couple of this Botswana, Cape Verde, some of the African cases that we discussed earlier, right? So these are above the virtuous circle and below the vicious circles. And this is what we study. We study if to understand, to do the process tracing of this mechanism, how the power balance changed, what empowered coalitions in these countries which are aiming for a different sort of governance, and if you can engineer these processes, because that's not in the least certain, right? Can I? Yeah, okay, I can. So we have two situations where our uh, knowledge applies. Situation number one is the one where I'm not really very much involved, but I get now and then calls from countries which are ruled autocratically by somebody who asks me what, what they can do. And I always say I work with historians, part of my Grand EU project, I have a group of historians working. You can always do what the King of Denmark did in 1800. We have put this together, very well documented, so if there is any despot out there who wants to stop spoiling and become an enlightened despot, we have a textbook for him. But the real, <laughs> but the real challenge for us is actually the second. And here is where I work, solving this collective action problem. We have over 80 countries presently which are democracy, but which are spoiling public resources in favor of certain group at the same level of an autocracy. And here is where most my work is. And I'll keep you posted of this, how many success cases will generate in the next 10 years. Thank you.